Good morning. This is a talk about using machines, computer models, to make better economic decisions. And I want to show you what I mean by focusing on a particular event, in fact, a particular decision. First of all, um, does anyone know who these guys are? Well, this is the governing council of the European Central Bank. They have responsibility for setting interest rates across Europe. Um, I want you all to imagine that you're sitting in that room on the 7th of July, 2011. It's their regular monthly meeting, and you have to take a decision about interest rates, about whether to keep them the same, whether to increase them, or whether to reduce them. Now, when economists or policymakers take decisions of that kind, the first thing they have to do is to make a judgment about the state of the economy. Is it growing or shrinking? Is the balance of risk towards heating up, increasing inflation, or cooling down, lost output and rising unemployment? They need to decide what is the state of the economy today. And you might say that's a slightly odd question, because after all, if I want to know the state of the weather today, all I have to do is look out of the window. But the state of the economy is a fact about literally millions and millions of transactions and activities across a wide geographic area. It's very difficult to measure, even in retrospect. So never mind forecasting the future. Forecasting the present is a real challenge in economics. And it's not for want of data. There's masses of data arriving every day. Statistics of all sorts, company reports, research reports, and in the background, of course, the markets are constantly generating information about prices and volumes of every conceivable kind, exchange rates, commodities, housing loans, you name it. And as that data comes in, there's lots of commentary too. There's no shortage of opinion on each of these new data points as they arrive. But it seems that no one really knows how to attribute the significance of each individual new piece of, of information. So the real challenge is to sift through all of this data and to form a coherent view on what it all means for the state of the economy. Um, that traditionally has been a problem or a job assigned to the gurus. Economic experts with years of accumulated experience who've used their wisdom to distill this information, to form a view on the state of the economy today, and hence on the appropriate policy response. However, in the last few years, a group of academics have developed a new generation of econometric models which do exactly this. Economists call this nowcasting. So, how do these models work? Well, first I need to take a step back and talk a little bit more about the nature of the problem, and specifically the nature of the data that we're trying to interpret. There are two real problems, timeliness and noisiness. Timeliness first. This is a list, a very simple list, of the most important economic indicators that you could look at for any economy, in this case, in this case Europe. And of course, this is a very simplified list. We could look at many, many more indicators than this. But these are probably the ones that the financial markets and the policymakers would regard as the most obvious and the most important to look at. Let's take the first item on the list, gross domestic product, or GDP. That is a measure designed specifically to give a unifying picture of the overall economy. It's the standard measure of the rate of activity in the economy. And it's certainly the indicator that the policymakers in Frankfurt would most want to see. Unfortunately, it's only published every three months, and the next publication date is in August. So it wouldn't have been that much use to them, sitting there on the 7th of July. All of the other indicators on this list are published monthly, and as you can see, most of them have been published within the last two or three weeks before this, this fateful meeting. And, however, there's another problem. They refer to periods well in the past. Manufacturing turnover, you can see there, was published in the first week of July, just before this, this meeting, but it actually told you what had happened in April. So these economic data series have long publication lags, and what's worse, the publication lags vary. 
Some of these series refer to April, some to May, and so forth. This is the problem of timeliness, the, the absence of good, timely data, and general messiness in the, the sequence and timeliness of, in, with which data does arrive. Now, you can see at the bottom of the list, there are three series there, three indicators, which are more timely. They're all published in June, and they all refer to June. But these are surveys. They report, um, survey respondents are asked questions like, are you more or less confident of the state of your household finances than you were last month? And the answers are translated into index numbers, which can be compared from month to month. Economists call this kind of information soft data. And they call it soft for a good reason, because, of course, what it reports is opinions. And opinions can be, from time to time, quite detached from reality. So you can get volatility in the survey indexes that has nothing to do with what's going on in the economy itself. Volatility in the data that doesn't relate to the underlying economy is the problem of noisiness. And in fact, it's much more widespread. It applies to the hard data, too. So the challenge is to, um, to take a large amount of noisy data and to extract a signal. Now, that's a classic big data problem. And these new nowcasting models are a classic big data solution. Because while it's true that there is a lot of noisiness in the economic data and all economic um, indicators, it's also true that there's a lot of what they call co-movement, which is to say that when the economy is going up, most of these indicators will also be going up. When the economy is going down, most of them will be going down. You wouldn't be surprised to discover if there was a surge in manufacturing output that there was also a surge in electricity consumption. This is a picture of 65 years of US economic history from 1947 to 2012. Each row represents one economic indicator, for example, output in a particular sector. Each column, each very narrow column, represents a month. And the colors show growth rates from month to month. Red is negative numbers, blue is positive numbers. So I hope what you can see from this, first of all, it's a wonderfully chaotic and noisy picture. But at the same time, you can see that there are some patterns. Towards the right-hand side, there's a sort of red stripe there. That's the recession of 2008 to 2009. Right in the middle, there's another red stripe. That's the recession of 1974 at the time of the OPEC oil price shock. And if you look closely, you will see more patterns. So what the model tries to do is to identify correlations, resilient correlations, among, among many, many different data series, resilient relationships which it can use to make predictions, to make forecasts. Now, doing that might sound like a very, very complex task. But in fact, the key is simplicity. Suppose you're going to London tomorrow, and suppose that you've never been there before. You might want to take a map. But what scale of map would you take? If you took a map with a scale of one to one, it would be no use to, it, to you. It would be completely impractical. If you took a map with a scale of one to 100,000, it might help you get to London, but it wouldn't be much use when you got there because it wouldn't have enough detail. The nowcasting model simplifies the data, simplifies data like this, by reducing it to a number of common factors. And in doing that, it strikes exactly the, the same balance that a good map strikes. It simplifies, but not so much as to lose crucial details. And it simplifies enough to reveal the essential features of the landscape, if you like, or the, the underlying movement in the economy. The other trick that the, that the model pulls off is to assign a weight, then, having identified those common factors, Every new piece of information that arrives every day, whether it's a flaky survey result or a solid piece of information about employment or trade, every new piece of information is assigned a unique weight which reflects not only its timeliness, but also its noisiness. And its noisiness an analyzed over years and years of history. And those weights constantly move. 
So that's what the model does. In doing that, it's, it's able to extract the maximum informational content of every single piece of economic news. That's what the model does. You can think of it as a signal extraction machine for economic news. So let's go back to that meeting on the 7th of July 2011 in Frankfurt. First of all, what did those guys know? What, what's the background? What did they have to work with? Let's just quickly rehearse the, the big picture background. As I'm sure everyone remembers, there was an enormous financial crisis in 2008. And following that crisis, all of the world's major Western economies, all of the major, world's major economies, I should say, went into sharp recession, from which they recovered more or less in the second part of 2009. But growth remained very sluggish throughout 2010. Then, in um, 2011, on the 13th of May, we got the first hard data for the beginning of for the, for 2011. The first quarter results, January, February, and March, GDP figure was released, and it showed a significant acceleration of, of growth from 0.3% to 0.8%. So that's, that's a starting point, but what, what will the policymakers around that table have to work with that's arrived since then, since the 13th of May. And of course, there will have been many, many data releases over that two-month period. But if you remember what I said about publication lags, most of those will have told them stuff about what was going on during the first quarter. And they've already got the information on what GDP was for the first quarter. So the question is, what additional, what incremental information do they have? And it's not that much. But what there is, you can see here, there are a few few hard data releases, There's, and many of them are positive. We've got uh, retail sales, construction, trade, manufacturing turnover, all came out in June, giving positive signals. And the, the length of these bars, by the way, reflect month-on-month -month growth rates. So the green is a positive signal, the red is negative. Unemployment was flat. There were a couple of indicators at the very end of the period, shortly before this meeting, that were negative. So it's a mixed picture, picture but overall probably positive. What about the soft data? Well, I've put the soft data on here. There are th those three surveys I showed you before, they're turning up each month. But I've put them here with pink bars, and pink bars of all the same length. And the reason is that you cannot compare directly the survey data with the hard data. They have different types of measurements, and we have to be very careful not to compare apples and oranges. But for what it's worth, they were all negative. Not hugely negative, but they were negative. So that, if you like, is the picture that the policymakers sitting there in Frankfurt on the 7th of July saw. It's a mixed picture. It's difficult to interpret, as it often is. What, would they, what, did, what did they do? Well, what would you have done? What they did was to put up interest rates by 0.25%. And what we can infer from that, almost certainly, is that they believed that on the balance of probabilities, the, the, the likelihood was that the recovery in the European economy during the second quarter was strengthening. OK, so what would you have seen had you put that same information through a nowcasting model? Take the same data and filter it through a model, and you get a picture like this. So each one of these bars represents, data, represents a, an individual day on which there has been at least one relevant data release. But in this, and this includes both the hard data and the soft data, in this case, they've all been put onto a, a comparable basis, so you can directly compare the lengths of those bars. Again, the green is positive, the red is negative. So already it looks more negative. But you can go one better, and you can express all of this in terms of a projection of GDP growth itself for the second quarter. And if you do that, you see what the model is really telling you. The model is telling you that GDP growth, that growth in the, the European economy was slowing down very substantially throughout the second quarter. Now, if you'd seen that picture, would you have put interest rates up on the 7th of July? OK, so what actually happened? Well, a month later, on the 16th of August, the numbers for GDP in the second quarter duly came out, and lo and behold, They'd fallen back to 0.2%. Since then, it's been a tale of woe. The uh, European economy eventually 
went into recession in the fourth quarter, it went negative, and it's been in or close to recession ever since. The European Central Bank reversed its interest rate decision in the, the autumn and has been fighting ever since to lift the European economy out of recession. The Danish physicist Niels Bohr apparently once said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Well, as I hope you can see, in economics, prediction is difficult even about the present. But as in so many fields, computer models are really challenging human judgment. This is the future of economics. Thanks very much.